Today's the feast. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I have to start over. Okay. Let's begin. <laughs> um, today's the feast of the archangels. So, which is appropriate because we're talking about angels too in the class. But um, I have a prayer specifically to uh, Saint Raphael, who's the patron of our parish. So let's go ahead and begin in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Raphael of the glorious seven who stand before the throne of him who lives and reigns forever and ever. Acknowledge our intentions and hear our prayer. Angel of health, the Lord has filled your hand with the divine balm from heaven to soothe and cure our pain. Heal and console the victims of disease and as the patron of travelers, help to guide our steps when doubtful of our ways in these times of darkness. Holy Raphael, we entreat you to insist, uh, assist us in all of our needs to strengthen our marriages, to guide us safely in our travels, to help provide for our material needs, and to protect us from the actions of the demons, to be at our side in all of the many trials of this life. As the physician of God, we pray that you will help to heal our souls of their many infirmities and our bodies of the numerous ills that afflict them, if this be favor be the will of God for our greater good. We plead for a share in your angelic purity so that we may be fit to be living temples of the Holy Spirit. May it please you, O Lord God, to direct your holy archangel Raphael to be our help, and may he whom we believe to be ever in attendance upon your divine majesty present our poor prayers to you for your blessing through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So, um, I passed out a little one-page front and back summary of um, sort of the angelic fall storyline, and we had gotten to the third one last week, but I'll just recover the first two uh, briefly, hopefully, as I can, and so we'll talk, there are three different Divine Falls recorded in the book of Genesis. And um, it's important to recognize that the Bible is a, what's called a, a low context culture. That is, the culture is so uh, solidified, so similar that um, there isn't a need for a lot of things. Um, if, if someone says a sentence or a word, everyone in the room will know what's being talked about. And so that's frustrating to people out of that culture and many years later because we don't have those cues, we don't have that consistency, we don't know. Each of these, this one's about, the actual fall is about eight verses long, Herman's four verses, and Babel's 11. So it's, it's important to realize that we're given the bare bones here because the people who would hear these stories already know the whole story. It's just setting forth the very parameters so that the audience, remember they were all listening to this, no one could read or write, you know, know the whole story. So you have to go through the rest of the Bible to kind of fit in all the pieces. And that's why I give you a lot of the uh, verses on those pages that you could look up on your own if you're interested at some point. But um, that's different than like the United States, which is a high context culture where we are so different in all kinds of things that we need reams and reams of paper to describe and tell each other about anything. Um, that being said, we are, each of us do have some familiarity with low context cultures, your family, your close <coughs> friends, right? Your, your dad or your mom will mention the beginnings of an event and everybody knows what you're talking about except other f people who aren't your family, right? And they're like, what are you talking about? That's the idea that you have to understand. But now realize that that's an entire culture is that tightly wo uh, woven together. So the first um, fall is in Eden. And it's a singular being, a singular um, I'll use the term angel, it's not really correct, uh, at least. The problem is, is that in the Old Testament, the word Elohim 
the word is a very generic word in Hebrew. It is used to describe anything that is no longer or never was part of this world. So Elohim is used for God himself. Whenever you see the word God without Lord, just God, it's Elohim. It's used for any of his, any of the gods of the nations, the word Elohim. It's used for any of the celestial, the angelic beings, no matter what their level of power, from the lowest angels to the most high, Elohim. And it's used of ghosts and spirits of deceased human beings. When Samuel has uh, the witch raise the spirit of, or when Saul has the witch raise the spirit of Samuel, I forget how they translate it in the New American, but she says, I see an Elohim rising from the earth. So Elohim is, it is a generic word that can mean anything preter or supernatural. And so because of that, it it's, um, can be confusing sometimes. So Nahash, the Nahash is one of these Elohim. And uh, as I put on the handout that I just gave you guys, a real short one, it was out of, a envy, out of envy he desired to destroy humanity, who he saw as his rival. From the very beginning of Genesis, the, um, we're told that the angels are created before this physical universe. Job tells us that. Uh, because when he confronts Job, he says, were you there when I laid the pillars of the earth? Were you there when the morning star sang in the morning and the angels, the sons of God, spoke of me? So they all behold the creation of the world. And then at the end of that first part of Genesis, God says, let us make man in our image. The us is not us, the Trinity. The us is the divine council. He's saying, I'm making another group of my family. The angels are already the sons of God. They're the first ones ever called that in the Bible, long before any human being is. So then he reveals to them that, um, remember, Eden is not earth per se. It's sort of a little piece of heaven on earth where heaven and earth connect. Um, and that's where God dwells on earth to be with his earthly creation, but his divine court dwells with him. The angels are there. Now, that doesn't, that's not as clear in Genesis, except that Nahash is there and that the cherubim are there at the end. But they're there the entire time. And if you were to look at the description in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, which we don't have time for, you would see the whole outline of this um, understanding. <coughs> Over on the side. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, with the with and here's the plan. Insofar as we can tell, <laughs> while at the current state of their existence, human beings are made lesser than the Elohim. The point of view is, as they move forward, and they fulfill God's um, uh, mandate to go forth, to subdue the earth, to exercise dominion to extend God's presence in Eden throughout the entire creation. And they're able to do that because they have the tree of life to live in, that they can always return to Eden, they can always sort of use it as their home base, so to speak, to return to the Lord, etc. They would therefore live forever, and by the time it was all complete, they would actually be the ones who reign over this world, and that would include over the angels. So, that's why they're referred to as ministering spirits sent to help us in the book of Hebrews. Well, at this time in history, there's only one who disagrees. Um, and he's one of the most powerful. Whether he's a cherubim or seraphim, we're not clear. He's described as both in, um, in the chapters of Isaiah and Ezekiel, but he was extremely powerful. He's what's called one of the throne guardians, the one who stand before God himself. Uh, Raphael's one of the other ones. When it made the mention, it says, uh, one of the glorious seven who stand before the throne. Um, those are the seven, the throne guardians, they're called. Well, he fell. He deceived humanity. Um, in doing so, he was hoping to eliminate his rival because he knew what God had said. When you eat the tree, you're going to die the death. It's a funny word. It actually, in Hebrew, says you'll die the death. Um, and what that means is it implies both the physical and and spiritual death. You'll be completely annihilated. And that's what Nahash was counting on, the serpent. When he thought as soon as they, if he could get him to break the command, 
then they're going to be annihilated by God, and that eliminates the human problem. And now the angels can rule over what he assumed was his own dominion. Well, God doesn't kill them immediately. Instead, he still sends them forth with the same rule, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. But now with the attached promise that as long, yes, you'll all die, but you'll die also in the generation after generation will repeat each other as long as you keep having children and such until eventually one of them, one of these children is the promised seed that will destroy your power. So you have that imagery. Now, Satan is portrayed as the Lord of death, right? Because he gets humanity to fall. That's why Jesus calls him a murderer from the beginning. Um, Hebrews 2.14 says he's the one who has the power of death. He holds that over us. And in Wisdom 2.23 to 24, it says everyone who is in his, quote, possession. It doesn't mean possessed like exorcism possession. It just means that he owns, die. And so he has acquired through our fall, in a sense, we've ceded our rulership of this world to him. Now, we still exercise dominion, obviously, as human beings, but in some way, beyond us and between God and us, we've allowed this being to kind of come in the way. Uh, Jesus is clear. He owns all the nations of the earth. The present age is evil, even now, with the church as it's striving towards the kingdom, and that he's um, uh, this quite powerful being. Jesus himself refers to him as the Lord of this world. Uh, Paul refers to him as the God of this age, and Paul elsewhere says that he's the spirit of the power of the air at work in the disobedient. That image of the power of the air, the idea that his influence, he's not omnipotent, he's nothing, he's a created being just like you and I. There is no real competition for an infinite God. But his influence is so pervasive, having ruled this world before human beings ever really stepped foot on it, in a sense, out of Eden into Earth itself, that he... He's like the air we breathe. In other words, <laughs> he's inescapable. He, his minions, his influence are everywhere. And so it's uh, as the church moves forward out of Israel, but this idea that you have this one particularly powerful original rebel who falls. The other weird thing about the story is that in the promise, which we usually think of in terms of Mary, but in Genesis 3.15, you have the three battles that are set forth as God pronounces judgment on each of the people in reverse order. He goes, um, I think, the serpent, Eve, and Adam. And so um, to the serpent, he does two things. He casts the serpent down to be lower than the humans that he just tricked. It's not an idea. They didn't really think snake, snakes had legs at one time, and now they didn't. That's stupid. All right, we, we tend to think everyone before our own time period were idiots and they didn't know anything about real life. They also didn't think average animals spoke to you. That's why it's clear from Hebrews who read the story, not modern 20th century people trying to look at it with a different worldview. It was clear from the beginning that creature is not a snake. He's a divine being, an Elohim. Um, anyway, we have this weird statement. He says, I'll put enmity between you the serpent, the snake, and the woman. And then he says, so you have one battle, the serpent versus the woman. Then he says, and I'll put enmity between your seed or your offspring or your children, it's plural, the serpent's children, and hers. So the woman has multiple children. So that's the second battle. And then the third one, the plural or the uh, pronoun suddenly changes, and it says, he will strike your head while you strike at his heel. So a particular uh, child, male child of the woman, will be the one who then fights the serpent. So you have these three battles. And um, the battles are recounted again, just very briefly, if you turn to Revelation book uh, chapter 12. The battles are highlighted in the very first book of the Bible, and the battles are lived out in the last book of the Bible. And um, just to look at it briefly, I don't want to spend a lot of time in Revelation, but he says, 
A great sign appeared in the sky, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. Um, imagery about the woman is, on the one hand, she's a queen, right? She has a crown. Two, in the Bible, always, celestial um, objects, the moon, the stars, the sun, all these things, those are always symbolic of divine type power. So this is a woman who clearly is not God, but has uh, divine-like power. <clears throat> then, she, then we find out she's pregnant, so she has a child. Then verse 3, then another sign appeared in the sky, a huge red dragon with seven heads and ten horns. Its tail swept away a third of the stars in the sky, hurled them to the earth. And then the battles start to begin. Then the dragon stood before the woman about to give birth to devour her child when she gave birth. She gave birth to a son, a male child, destined to rule the nations with an iron rod. Now, even in Greek, this is a silly verse. <laughs> Maybe not in modern America with our weird gender stuff. But why would you have to say a son, a male child? <laughs> Right? Why does John have to be so stupidly repetitive? It's because he's quoting Genesis 3.15. He wants everyone without any doubt to realize what he's talking about. The son born here is the one from Genesis 3.15, the male child, the he that's over there. So that's why he does that. He's really directing our attention um, to that this is one of the battles that God had promised. And then... Her child was caught up to God and his throne. Now, it's interesting. John doesn't even describe anything of Jesus' life. He just says, oh, and then he was ascended to heaven. In other words, the battle with Satan was nothing for Christ, even though from our point of view it might have looked horrible, death and everything. No, he just ascends. The dragon can't touch him. So that's actually the second one listed in Genesis, but it occurs first here in the storyline. Well, then uh, it's at that moment that we're told in verse 7 that the war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels battled against the dragon. Dragon and its angels fought back, but they did not prevail. And there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And then again in verse 9, John does something specific to make sure we are absolutely clear who he's talking about. He says, the huge dragon, the ancient dragon, serpent right so again genesis 3:15 don't miss the connection who is called the devil and satan who deceived the whole world was thrown down to earth and its angels were thrown down with it now something interesting to point out and augustine pointed this out a long time ago satan was not cast out of heaven in genesis he was cast down in power he doesn't actually fall from heaven, because he's still there in Job also, remember, until Jesus' ascension and death, the Paschal mystery. That's when Satan is cast from the heavenlies. So much later in history than maybe we think. In our, you know, in, in, in human lifetime, not just 2,000 years ago or so. And then he uh, talks about, the, he sings this hymn, and everyone in heaven singing, and then verse 12, so rejoice you heavens and you that dwell in them. Why? Because he's not there with you anymore. <laughs> but woe to you, earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great fury, for he knows he has a short time. So he's angry, he's furious, he's humiliated. So because of that, here on earth, he now turns his attention, which would be the first one listed in Genesis, but is listed second here. When the dragon saw that it had been thrown down the earth, it pursued the woman who had given birth to the child. And I don't want to, there's a lot of imagery here that I don't want to worry about, except I'll just mention a few things. In verse 15, it says the serpent, and notice how it switches back and forth between dragon and serpent now, yeah. because they're interchangeable. It's the same thing. It says the serpent spewed a torrent of water out of its mouth to sweep the woman away with the current. Okay, I've mentioned that water is the symbol of the demonic. Right? That's why um, when Jesus is crossing the sea of Galilee in order to go to Gadarene, where he's going to ex exercise the demons and the people there, 
all of a sudden the storm rises up and tries to drown the boat. And what does Jesus do? He rebukes the storm. Now, most of the time when Jesus does nature miracles, he doesn't speak to them personally. You don't rebuke things that don't have sentience. You rebuke things that are alive. So the storm itself is demonically caused. It's the power of the, the ocean, so to speak, is, this, is the demons trying to stop him. Because then he gets there, he performs the exorcisms, he casts the demons out. They tell him that he can't send them away yet. It's not quite time. So what does he do? He puts them in the pigs like they ask. And what do the pigs do? They drown in the water, right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's the greatest irony is the story, is the power destroys itself through Jesus. Jesus commands even it at their own level, they destroy themselves. And that comes from the, the image of water is the fact that uh, the word abyss, which comes from the Bible, the, the word abyss means the depths. And so we call the lowest parts of the ocean here on earth now the abyss. But it was understood because it was like murky and dark and swirling and kind of chaotic that in the popular imagination it was understood to be sort of the symbol of the abode of the demons, uh, the powers that live between heaven and earth, so to speak, in this nebulous realm, uh, which they call Jesus, or uh, the Bible calls the upper waters in the beginnings of Genesis. He separates the upper waters from the lower ones. And that's why it says the devil fell down to earth and sea. He's come down to these ones. That's why I know people don't realize it nowadays, but that's why baptism is baptism. In baptism, you pass with Jesus through the powers literally of hell and death, where the demons are, and come up the other side of the water, a new person in Christ. The imagery isn't just drowning. The imagery is you've passed through the demonic realm and all that they can throw at you and you've come out new on the other side. You, with Jesus with you, you've passed through it. Because if Satan's the Lord of death and all these things, then it, there's a symbolism to it of why baptism is the way it is. When you read the fathers of the church in their catechetical lectures, when they would do RCIA, the equivalent back then, uh, they meant that that was big in their understanding. We don't hear it as much anymore, Although even in the current RCIA process, there are three exorcisms that must take place for the unbaptized prior to Easter Vigil um, that kind of lead up to this point. Uh, and that's why most original baptismal fonts uh, or pools to walk in had six steps, three on one side and three on the other, because you would take one step down with each renunciation of Satan. Do you renounce Satan? I do. And all his empty works? I do and all his empty promise of, I do. And then you're in the water. Then you're baptized. Then you come up the other side, and there's the three steps. Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty? I do, do you? And so it was a very symbolic image of how you came in and went back out. Okay, anyway, so, so that's why Satan's power, it basically is saying in layman's terms, he throws all of his power at this woman to destroy her, right? In his anger, He's been humiliated by the son. He's at least going to punish the son and God by, by destroying the mother. Then it says, verse 16 is very odd, but the earth helped the woman and opened its mouth and swallowed the flood that the dragon spewed out. Okay. Again, I don't want to get too bogged down in, in this, but <laughs> this refers really to the immaculateness of Mary. Right? When Adam and Eve were in Eden, everything was in harmony. Animals, plants, the whole earth was in harmony. And so it's the image that he can't touch her. She's never come under his dominion in any way. Not possessing any sin of her own, first by being born without original sin, but also then through her own life of always choosing, no matter how difficult or how much suffering it entailed, always choosing to follow God. Um, without that sin, he literally has nothing against her. So he loses the second battle. And we know that because it turns his attention in verse 17 to the final battle. Then the dragon became angry with the woman, right? First he's angry with the son, so he tries to kill the woman. Can't kill the woman, gets angry at her now. So he went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, her other children. Who are they? It defines them. Those who keep God's commandments, at that point, that would only be Jews. But there's an and. 
and bears witness to Jesus. Then it, the dragon, took its position on the sand of the sea. So again, the sea representing where it's going to draw his power from. And that's why we're not going to look at chapter 13. But chapter 13, if you notice, the first 10 verses are the first beast, Satan's, quote, first child. And verses 11 to the end of chapter, I think it's verse 18, is the second beast. So you have the false prophet and the antichrist. So that gives us some indication of who his children are. Now, his children are not, are not um, they are human beings, clearly, by calling them his children, we're really referring to anyone who opposes the building up of God's kingdom, whether in the Old Testament or the New. Not just kind of a bad person, but someone who actively op opposes the church, who opposes you know, the Jews, the religion, Christ, those people are all, by definition, children of Satan. <coughs> who is the first? Who is Satan's first child? John tells us. If we go to 1 John chapter 3, the letter, 1 John, he tells us who the first child of Satan was. He says, if I can find it. There we go. Start with verse, um, well, actually, we can start with verse 1 and then just... Uh, John chapter, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. See what love the Father has bestowed on us that we may be called the children of God. Yet so we are. The reason the world does not know us is that they did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we shall be has not yet been revealed. We do know that when it is revealed, we shall be like him, for we will, shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope based on him makes himself pure as he is pure. So John begins by telling us, look, your, your um, divine childhood is real. Right? It's not symbolic. It's not metaphorical. You are truly. That is what you are. He goes, sure, you don't walk around feeling like you're a child of God because everyone else hates you. right? They think you're an idiot. They don't. And he goes, why would you think otherwise? The divine son himself they didn't like. They're not going to like you. Right? Do you think you're going to do better than Jesus? I mean, that's kind of what he's saying. And then he gives us this great promise that he's all, we're already God's children right now at this moment in this world through our baptism. But he says, we're going to be something even more. He says, what it is, I don't even have a word for yet. But we just know we'll be like him even more so than we are now. So he has this great promise of what's coming for you and I. But then he now makes this, this distinction. He says, verse 4, everyone who commits sin commits lawlessness, for sin is lawlessness. You know that he, Jesus, was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. Now, uh, drop down to, well, he refers to us as children, so that always gives us a head up, but drop down to verse 8. He says, Whoever sins belongs to the devil because the devil has sinned from the beginning. Indeed, the Son of God was revealed to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is begotten by God commits sin. So there's, he says, no one, uh, because God's seed remains in him. And that's the word actually used in Genesis. I will put enmity between your seed and her seed. So the Christian has God's seed in them. And it doesn't mean we never actually fall into sin, because he told us two chapters ago when we sin, we always have someone to fall back on in reconciliation. But it means that our lives are not dominated by the world, the flesh, and the devil, unless we've chosen to let them do that again. However, in this way, verse 10, the children of God and the children of the devil are made plain. No one who fails to act in righteousness belongs to God, nor anyone who does not love his brother. So there you have the sons of the woman again, who are also the children of God, and the sons of the devil, uh, the serpent, the children of the devil. And then he gives us an example. For this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Unlike Cain, who belonged to the evil one and slaughtered his brother, why did he slaughter him? Because his own works were evil and those of his brother righteous. Do not be amazed then, brothers, that the world hates you. So who is devil's first son? Cain. Cain. 
And Cain starts the split between two choices in humanity, the line of Cain and the line of Seth. And so they image, not only do you have sort of uh, any kind of historical breaking up of peoples at a certain time, but they're sim they are symbolic for two ways of life, right? And that two ways will then dictate the rest of the Bible. That's why the first Psalm set talks about the righteous versus the wicked. And Jesus talks about the two paths, a narrow one that leads to life and the broad one that leads to destruction. Over and over we see this, it's called the two ways. And so it begins here in Cain's the first. Then when we get to um, the time of Jesus, just jumping ahead so we can clear and get to the second one now, um, Jesus himself refers to those who oppose him as brood of vipers. Three times in the letter, or in the Gospel of Mark, he calls people the brood of vipers. John the Baptist calls them brood of vipers once. And in John chapter 8, he actually refers to them as children of the devil. So when he is opposed by people, because what is a brood of vipers? It's literally children of serpents. <laughs> That's what the word means. So over and over again, we actually do see this image as it works out. It's, it is always human beings. It's human beings who chose this way, this path. And it doesn't mean we're not talking about devil worshipers, of which there's actually very few in the world. We're talking about people who are his pawns because of their hatred for good things. Right? They're so... For whatever reason, they've become so twisted, so anti-whatever, they oppose God, they oppose the church, they like militantly so. That's who he's kind of referring to, not just any person who does bad things or who doesn't, or any just person who doesn't happen to believe in God or be Christian. He's more specific. Anyway, so let's move on then. Second one. So the second fall, because there is more than one occurs in Genesis chapter 6, and just once more we'll look at it real briefly because it's such a short chapter, but it's so weird. And that is, um, we're told this story. Genesis chapter 6. When human beings began to grow numerous on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw how beautiful the daughters of human beings were, so they took them for their wives, whomever they pleased. It actually doesn't say wives, it says it took for their themselves. The word wife is put in by the translator, and a lot of other Bibles don't include the word because they think that's saying something that's not there. In other words, it denotes too nice and proper a relationship. It's unlikely the angels came down and said, will you marry me, right? It's more you get this idea of a forced violence of something. But anyway, um, these, then the Lord said, my spirit shall not remain in human beings forever because they are only flesh. Their days shall comprise 120 years. Now, it's interesting because the word spirit here would normally be ruach. That's the word for spirit. Like when God breathes his spirit into Adam, when you talk about the Holy Spirit in the first chapter of Genesis, it said the spirit of God, the ruach Elohim, was over the waters. But he doesn't use that word here. He uses the term Elohim which I told you is this generic term for the angels and such. His concern is not with humanity in the sense of what, he's, okay, what God is getting to is this. I cannot let these blasphemous things that were never meant to be part of creation exist. These things that are human, but at the deepest core of their being, their spirit is something different. You know, we're, we're made of three parts, you and I, body, soul, spirit. Well, the, the Nephilim is who they're mentioning. Verse 4. The Nephilim appeared on earth in those days as well as later after the sons of God had intercourse with the daughters of human beings who bore them sons. They were the heroes of old, the men of renown. So what you have are you have, in a sense, um, remember God sort of threw down the gauntlet to the serpent and said, my seed versus your, the seed of the woman who belongs to me versus you, etc. It seems now that this is almost a response to that. Now, Satan is never mentioned in this storyline, and there's no indication that he was directly involved. We do know by the time of Jesus' time period, he's come to dominate all the other fallen spirits. But whether he was actually personally part of this one or not is never, ever connected anywhere in the scriptures. So... God just can't let this one live because you literally have like a, so you have human beings who are made in the divine image of God himself. 
And now you have human beings who are made in the divine image of God, but also, if you will, are also have the divine image of these lesser angelic creatures. That's why he says it can't remain. These things can't remain in flesh. It's not how it's meant to be. In other words, the Nephilim, to look at it in those technical terms, have a human body, soul, and an angelic spirit. At their deepest core, they're not human, really. They're something else. And that's why God sort of pronounces this judgment. Um, we also have something that has began with Cain and now carries over here. Um, after the flood, which both has twofold effect, the flood will destroy Cain's family line who brought idolatry into the world. We don't have time to go over that, which probably is what led to this situation. Uh, it also destroys these, the Nephilim. But what had sort of what you see happening throughout is that there's this struggle that is, surrounds the Hebrew word Shem. Now, the Hebrew word Shem simply means name. That's what it means. The first time it arises is in Cain's case. He's kicked out of, he's, well, they were kicked out of Eden, and then Cain's kicked out even further from where they settled after Eden. He has to become this wanderer. He doesn't listen to God. Instead of wandering, he immediately builds a city, and he names it after his son uh, Enoch. And so you have this first thing of Shem. Now, when we get to the Nephilim, unfortunately in English we, we mess up the translation, but that last verse, it says, they were heroes of old, the men of renown. It literally says, the men of Shem. So they're these powerful, arrogant, warrior beings. And then the last time it'll come, which we're not there yet, is connected to the last sin in chapter 11, if you look real quickly at the Tower of Babel. And in verse 4, they said, let us build a city and a tower with its top in the sky and so make a name for ourselves. So all three, these sins, Cain, who's the son of the devil, symbolically, the sin of the Nephilim at Hermon, and the sin of Babel all involve a great arrogance and pride. I'm going to exalt myself. Cain exalts himself even after his horrendous act. The Nephilim exalt themselves as the greatest warriors and kings and such, and the builders of Babel exalt themselves. Then, suddenly, after the flood, we have the story of Noah, and Noah's oldest son is named Shem. In, the, in English Bibles, most English Bibles today, when you see this word in all capitals, Lord, it is an indication that the divine name is there, that is not to be pronounced. So it's God's personal name. Jews do not still abide by this for hundreds of years. They don't use that. What Jews call God is Hashem, the name. So when, you, when you're speaking of God, you say Hashem. Or what you do is you mix up the letters and create a fake word that's Havaya, which still has the four letters but mixed up, so you're not actually pronouncing God's name. But Hashem means the name. Shem will be the ancestor of all those people of Abraham's lineage. Those are the Semitic peoples. The Semitic people are the men of the name. What is that? They're the men... Who, or the, they're the people of the God. That's what it means. They're the people who bear the very name of the creator. And so there's this opposition that's kind of an underlying one that's going through between those who exalt themselves, uh, Cain and the Nephilim and the Babel, and God's people who you know, follow that way of, of humility, of obedience to the Lord, etc. So that's kind of an underlying theme. Now to finish with this story, a question, quick, yeah. too, please. Um, the Tower of Babylon, that came after the flood? Yes. So uh, it was really Noah's <clears throat> sons that were saved and their descendants. Right. <laughs> and we'll talk about but that. Was, when, we, when we get to Babel, we'll talk about how things go south really quickly. Okay. That, that nothing happens without God's will, okay? Right. Right. But what is the, why was the, why did he create or allow 
I have no idea. <laughs> I don't have any idea. Although we're going to see they appear a lot more than we think. So because there is this weird thing, and I mentioned it last time, if you go back and, and look at, uh, at the verses, look at verse 4 again. The Nephilim appeared on earth in those days, as well as later. So this is an ongoing sin, because weren't they all destroyed in the flood? So, um, yeah, to some extent. Well, well, so the flood comes. The flood is the punishment. We're, we know what happens in the flood. All flesh dies, and that includes the Nephilim. But what happened to these angels? Well, we know that from four references in the New Testament. So this was a big story. It, it, it's, uh, you know, most of us today don't even know this story. And those who do just kind of shuff it off as some weird mythological, weird little tale, you know, moral story or something. But the Bible refers to it a lot in the New Testament, starting with Peter himself. If we go to 2 Peter, 2 Peter, um, chapter 2. So 2 Peter, not 1 Peter that we're reading right now, but 2 Peter, chapter 2, is all about false teachers. And he's comparing the heretics of today in the church, his time, but also, I guess, today, um, to these great uh, deceptions and falls of sin of those who should have been holy in the past. And so, first of all, how he describes a lot of what they're doing, he says they're false teachers, they'll introduce destructive heresies, they'll deny their master. Verse 2, they'll follow licentious ways and greed. Right? Those are all terms for like sexuality and you know, amassing fortunes and such. Now, verse 4, he now refers to this incident. He says, if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but condemned them to the chains of Tartarus and handed them over to be kept for judgment. And if he did not spare the ancient world, even though he preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, together with seven others when he brought a flood upon the godless world. And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction, reducing them to ashes, making an example for the godless people of what is coming, and so on and so forth. So he, he ends by saying he knows how to keep the devout from trial, Keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment, especially those who follow the flesh with its depraved desire and show contempt for lordship. So notice his three examples. The angels, which leads immediately into the flood because it's their deal creating the Nephilim that lead to the flood. And then what's his third example, which seems maybe out of place at first? Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, why does he add that one? Because Sodom and Gomorrah is about homosexuality, which is defined as, quote, strange flesh, which is the actual word he uses here. And angels having sex with humans is also strange flesh. They're both sexual sins, and they're both destroyed because of it. Now, Sodom and Gomorrah is even more ironic because the men think they're only committing homosexuality, but what are they actually doing? Because who are the men they want to rape? Remember the story? Angels. They're reversing the sin of Hermon. Now it's humans trying to mate with angels. Now they don't know that. So that's the irony behind the story. But they're destroyed not for that. They're destroyed because of the homosexuality and the, and the rape that's, and all the stuff that's going on. And so he ties them together that that's what unites the three is this great sexual sin. For whatever reason, again in God's plan and, and wisdom and we don't know, you have Satan running free to this day and yet these angels are imprisoned for what they did. They're in Tartarus. Now he uses a term that would not be, would, he uses a term because he's writing to Greek speaking Gentile Christians. Because Tartarus is a theme from Greek mythology where the Titans, who were also powerful demigods, were imprisoned. So he's falling back on his Jewish understanding, but he, in his case he uses a word that his, readers will have a better understanding of what is going on. Now Jude, and these, these letters are very short, if you just go a little bit further towards the end, you'll find Jude in just a few pages. Jude and, and Peter seem to be pulling from the same common, probably a pre-Christian 
um, theme or idea because they're very similar. Uh, Jude will use two of the three examples, but then at the end, he's much more explicit about the sin than the other one, than Peter. He says, verse 5 of Jude, he's only got one chapter. I wish to remind you, although all these, uh, I wish to remind you, although you know all things, that the Lord who once saved a people from the land of Egypt later destroyed those who did not believe. So he uses Egypt instead of some of the other ones, but then his other two follow. The angels, too, who did not keep to their own domain, but deserted their proper dwelling, he has kept in chains and gloom for the in eternal chains and gloom for the judgment of the great day. So, like Peter, he tells us these angels are trapped. They've been trapped for their sin since it occurred. Likewise, Sodom, Gomorrah, and the surrounding towns, which in the same manner as they, as who? The angels he just talked about indulged in sexual promiscuity and practice unnatural vice. The word in Greek is literally went after strange flesh. They serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. And then he goes on, these dreamers nevertheless def also defile the flesh, scorn lordship, and revile the glorious beings, a term for the highest angels, the glorious ones in Hebrew. And then he talks about the archangels. So, but you get the idea, right? These ones are, these are the angels they're referring to are always these ones because they're the only angels ever spoken of who committed sex with anybody. Satan's never accused of that. The Babylonian, the Babylonian, the Tower of Babel incident doesn't occur with that. So these are the angels. Now, Peter will refer to it in the letter we're reading, but if you don't know what the background, it makes it's hard to understand. But in 1 Peter, the first letter of Peter, chapter 3, he kind of alludes to it almost in an offhand way um, because he's really talking about suffering as Christians and how as Christians our suffering is like that of Jesus and how Jesus' suffering was salvific. And so in his description of this, he has this weird statement in verse 18 of chapter 3. He says, Christ also suffered for sins once the righteous for the sake of the unrighteous, that he might lead you to God. Put to death in the flesh, he was brought to life in the spirit. So in the spirit, in the resurrected, in his, in his glorified person, in it he also went to preach. It's a horrible translation. It says to pronounce. To pronounce to the spirits in prison who had once been disobedient while God patiently waited in the days of Noah during the building of the ark. So he makes a pit stop on his way to heaven to confront these angels. They're the ones in prison. That's why they're spirits. Human beings aren't spirits. Even when our dead aren't spirits, they're a soul. He's there to pronounce judgment that if you think you're getting out or if you think you were going to win, right? Sorry. So it's almost like a victory dance. He pronounces on the way up, there is no freedom for you, right? You're done. With one exception. <laughs> and that'll be our last, our last verse to look at this. In Revelation chapter 9. Now, the way that when you connect Revelation and Paul's writings about the last days and some of the other authors with Jesus's statements in the Gospels, where Jesus gives us kind of the pattern and the timeline. So Jesus is the basis, and then scholars fit and help connect where, the other, where these other events occur within Jesus' timeline. And in Jesus' timeline, we're all in the last days. From the moment he was died and rose, the last days have begun. Satan is now cast out. We're in the final age of humanity, however long chronologically that'll last. However, he does give a final time period of the very last, last snippet before the end. And that's the Great Tribulation, which lasts three days. Now, in Revelation, in chapters, um, I think, 9 through 11, there will be three great, quote, woes or curses. Um, this is the first one that we read. And then there's two more. So one corresponds, each woe corresponds to one of the years as it gets closer and closer to the end. 
So this is the fifth trumpet. So this begins the tribulation. And remember what Jesus said about the tribulation. It'll be so terrible that if it was longer than three years, nobody would be saved. Nobody would be able to hold out. But because of the elect, it'll only be three years. So we got to know it's going to be bad. And one of the things that makes it bad is the fact that God allows, whether for one year or three, it's not clear, the whole tribulation or only the first year of it, he allows these angels, who arguably have been the most interactive with the human race ever in their evil, to be freed again, to let loose upon our world. And he allows Satan to be the one to do it. So chapter 9, verse 1. Then the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. So that's Satan. The, the, the angels are always imaged as stars. It was given the key to the passage to the abyss. It opened the passage to the abyss, and out came all the, we don't need to describe, it, it's all symbolic descriptions of what they are, but all those beings are released. And they had as their king, verse 11, they had as their king the angel of the abyss, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek, Apollyon. The first woe has passed, two more are to come. So for a short time, whether one year or three years, in the very end, as part of um, the last great rebellion against God and his people, um, they will be released for a short time, these beings. But otherwise, they're completely um, out of the loop, so to speak, right now. So what happened to the Nephilim? And why are they still around when the author writes this? Well, the second one I can't fully answer because nobody knows for certain. But what happened to the Nephilim are they're wiped out in the flood. However, because their spirits are that of the, Elo the Elohim that gave birth to them, their soul and bodies are wiped out. They're killed like any other human. But their spirits still are tied to this earth. right? They're never creatures of the supernatural world because they weren't part of it ever. But yet they have enough of that, an that angelic being in them that they remain and retain. So what are they? That's what a demon is. It becomes confusing because of the New Testament. The New Testament, the way that the Old Testament used the generic word Elohim to refer to any kind of spirit being. In the New Testament, unfortunately, and in church tradition later, it has been customary to refer to any of the good ones as angels and any of the bad things as demons. It's very imprecise and it be con can be confusing but they are different things. Um, anyway, so that's what happened. That's where the demons come from. That's why the demons want to possess bodies. Oh. Satan doesn't care about possessing bodies. He's more powerful than any human being would ever give him. And he never had a physical body that he has to worry about what it feels like or cares. And these angels, as we're going to see soon, they don't want to possess bodies. These are the principalities and powers. They already reign over whole countries and nations and lineages. Why would they care about possessing a body? It's only something that once knew what embodied existence felt like <laughs> that wants it again. Um, That's a wow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a great book is a, An Exorcist Looks at... What's the book? He has like 100 books now. I mean, uh, he's passed away just recently, a few years ago, but the chief exorcist of Rome... Um, Anyway, uh, he has a lot of books, and his, it's funny because Father Grishel, who was still alive at the time when the first book came out and wrote the foreword to it, uh, I remember buying it, and I'm reading, and I love Father Grishel, and I'm reading his foreword, <laughs> and even Father Grishel is like, there's a lot of, st I'm paraphrasing, but he's like, there's a lot of things in here that you've just got to be prepared for, because they're nothing you've ever heard in CCD classes and stuff, you know, <laughs> nothing. Um, you know, he talks about the seven levels of demonic possession from infestation of objects to, you know, all the way down. It's, but anyway, before we get too far afield. But yeah, so you have this crazy stuff going on. Now, when it says the Nephilim are hereafter, though, that's not what it's referring to. It means they're still around. That I can't answer for you. I simply will say a connection that the Bible makes without telling us how. And that is immediately after the flood, 
and this kind of goes back to your question earlier about Babylon and such. Immediately after the flood, um, and the flood ends in chapter 9, you have, uh, you have the new covenant made with Noah, where he basically says, okay, now start over. Now go and do what you're supposed to do the first time with Adam. Have dominion, spread throughout the earth, take it. So, right, the command is given again. And then we're told Noah has his sons. And then chapter 10 breaks down the 70 descendants or 70 nations that spring from Noah's children. Okay, all this symbolic number. That's why there's 70. Um, now, one of them, the worst of, of his sons, <laughs> is the man named uh, Ham or Ham. Now, I don't know if you remember the story of Noah. This isn't one that you learn in, kinder, in CCD either, usually. If you remember, there's almost a re-second Garden of Eden. You had the Garden of Eden where there's an orchard, you know, it's an orchard, and you ate the wrong fruit, and you got in trouble because of it. Well, we're told what's one of the first things Noah does after the flood is he plants a vineyard. And then he drinks it and gets, passes out drunk. And then do you remember what happens to him? It's super vague, right, because Hebrews don't like to mention evil things. Right? Sometimes it's frustrating. They'll be like, I cursed the man, and I said, may thus and this be done to you, with whatever. And that's what it says. And you're like, I want to know what he said. But they won't even tell you the curse because they're like, no. Nope. So it says something really weird. It says like Ham looked upon his father's nakedness, mm -hmm. etc. And then the two other brothers find out what happened. And they go in backwards in the room and they use a, a thing, a, a, a blanket to cover him. And then Noah, when he responds, he says when he said what his son had done to him. So we're clearly not talking about just seeing somebody nude. So what is all this Hebrew euphemism getting at? Two things which are horrific, even in our time, right? which is a pretty bad time, sexually speaking, but still horrific. Ham, who's the youngest of the sons, is attempting to gain dominance over the human race. It's about to start, right? We've just got a new covenant. You have a new covenant mediator. Heck, I think I want to be that. So how do you do that in the ancient world? Two ways. You rape your father to show his inability and you rape his wife, which may or may not be your mother, to show his ineffectuality protecting his family. Oh. That's what Ham did. Oh. And that's why his son, Cush, is cursed. It's the son who's cursed by Noah, not the father. Oh. Because he's the fruit of this rape. And so he's the one who carries this taint. Now, when we look at Ham's descendants, we're going to see a very, we're going to see a pattern. So he names Ham's descendants in chapter 10 of Genesis, starting with verse 6. Oh, by the way, it's not the only time it happens. A more famous one that most people do know is Absalom does that to all of David's wives, oh. including his own mother. Oh. After he chases David out of the city, he puts the bed out in public and has sex with all of David's wives. That's why when David returns, he has to dismiss them all. Mm. Uh, they're still his wives, but they live in seclusion the rest of their lives. It's this. It, so it was... A common thing, I guess, at that time. But anyway, we'll look at this, and then we'll, we're at our break. But put something into water in the bed. Yeah, I know. <laughs> just like, just like uh, wells are like the singles bars of the ancient world. Like Moses meets his wife at a well. Jacob, like everybody, and that's the whole story of Jesus goes to the well. And anyway, so here's the descendants of Ham, and first it lists his actual sons: Mizraim, Put, uh, Cush. Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. Canaan's the one who is birthed by his mother, own mother. Now, Mizraim is actually how it's pronounced. Mizraim is actually the word for Egypt. So the Egyptians, or at least their progenitor, comes from Ham. The Canaanites, and they're, they're who enslaved Israel, right? <laughs> the Canaanites, we know what they did. They're the ones who fought Israel for the Holy Land. But then go a little bit further. Now he breaks up some of the specific sons of Ham. So now we're getting to the grandsons and further lineage. And you get to Cush. Now Cush is the um, oldest of, of uh, Ham's sons. It says Cush became the father of Nimrod. Now Nimrod is, uh, the very name means, his name means rebellion. Now then it explains, then it takes all these verses to explain Nimrod. It says he was the first to become a mighty warrior on earth. He was a mighty hunter in the eyes of the Lord. Hence the saying, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter in the eyes of the Lord. 
His kingdom originated in Babylon, Erech, Akkad, all of them in the land of Shinar. From that land, he went forth to Assyria, where he built Nineveh, rehoboth Ir, and Kala, as well as Rezin between Nineveh and Kala, the latter being the principal city. So a couple things about Nimrod and why he stands out. First, that he's the only he's named at all. We do know who he is. Ninurti Kana the second, or the first, oh. the founder of Babylon. That's his name. That's the Babylonians claim that. So he was a historical person. Now, calling him a mighty warrior, guess what the word is? <laughs> he's a man of the Shem of renown. He's a Nephilim somehow. We don't know how, but he has some taint to him. He will give birth to the four groups that will be Israel's enemies. The Egyptians who enslaved them, the Canaanites who imposed them, and the Assyrians and Babylonians who literally destroy God's own people's kingdom in this world. Right? And Babylon will always be the image of the great evil. That's why even in the, new t in the book of Revelation, what is the oppositional power called? The whore of Babylon. Now, just to give you a little background from the Babylonian side, when we look at the Middle East of, of this time period, ancient, like uh, uh, Abraham's time period, we have to realize that all these countries of the Middle East from the, what's called the Levant, the whole coastland and everything, they all shared a very, very similar culture. And they also shared most of the same stories. In the case of the neighbors of Israel, they were pagan stories, but they were still stories. The Babylonians have the story of the ark. The Babylonians have all these, and guess what in the Babylonian story? There are beings called the Apkalu who came from heaven to earth, mated with human women, and that was the Babylonians' claim to fame in the time of Israel. We are the last living vestige of the Nephilim. They claimed it. This wasn't just a Hebrew idea. Their enemies claimed it, but they saw it as a badge of honor. We hold the last remnants of the pre-flood knowledge. Our kings are descended from the Nephilim. And look, you're here in exile, so I guess your God wasn't all that powerful after all. Our gods are. And that's why by the time of the exile, Israel has to go through this whole sort of crisis to struggle with what is God doing? Why is he allowing this? So you have, you have the connection now where the Nephilim are back in some manner. And remember, he's the king of Shinar. Is where this, Shinar is a region. It's where Babylon and all these areas are located, a large fertile plain area in the Mesopotamian region. So keep that in mind. Take our break. We'll come back. We'll look at Babel. And then we'll see what's going on with all the Nephilim because all of a sudden you're going to find out everywhere you look, they're there. See, I'm glad you didn't miss it, Dave. I would have had to. You, I would have never been able to explain it all to you again. You would just had to watch the video. <laughs> so is Xerxes the second, you said? No, uh, his name is uh, Ninad Nurti. It actually puts... Nimrod. Yeah, Nimrod. Nimrod. If you look him up, um, it, it may give you the historical stuff about him. I think even the, the New Testament, I think this one even has a footnote to him, if I can find it. Let's see. Oh. Nimrod, to Kulti Ninur to the first, the Assyrian conqueror of Babylon, the famous city builder. <laughs> Akulti, A K U L T I, dash Ninurti. Yes. The, 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 the chief exorcist was Father Gabriel Amort. Amort, thank you. Thank you. An exorcist tells his story. Now that's the name of the book I was trying to think of. He's had a lot of books since then, though. He's pretty cool. I like, yeah. For a while, Netflix had that actual ex. It was a pretty boring one, but they had that exorcism he performed on that woman live, and they let it be filmed. 
fucking joke. He's so mellow, like, you know, the movies and everything. He just tells it to shut up. He thumbs his nose, that Italian thing at the, at the devil when it says, or the demon when it says stop. It did get weird, though, because not him, but the filmmaker, who was William Peter Blatty, who filmed The Exorcist, and that's why he was interested in this. He went to meet with the boyfriend of the woman at a church afterwards, and the guy threatened their lives on camera. He's like, I'm going to kill you and all this. So they, like, run out of it. So it's, it might still be on Netflix. It's Gabriel Amor's Exorcism. I like the conversations between him and yeah, he like, just. Uh, Father, you don't look too good today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's funny. Uh, He's quite critical of the church, though, not having more exorcists. Yeah, he also was critical of when they redid the, um, the whole rite of exorcism. He thought it was pretty watered down. I guess the church gives permission to use either one now, but he, uh, he was always a big. Yeah. Unless, unless the angels did more, did something again, and they fell, we don't know. Like I say every week, this is something new to us. <laughs> I can't remember the woes in order right now. Yeah. I think we're in the first one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's what you're actually praying for in the Lord's Prayer. You know, in, in the modern day one, the way we've said it for so long is lead us not to temptation, deliver us from evil. But in the in the scriptural actual version, he says, "Do not subject us to the final test and deliver us from the power of the evil one." It's very specific. The final test is, I don't want to. You're asking God, don't make me be one of the people alive when the tribulation hits. <laughs> yeah. That's not a fun place to be. So. Better be given a lot of grace. Yeah. So, yeah, supposedly that, that's okay. how, how most people no. read it, that that has to have occurred by then. Another yeah. note on 1, chapter 
Okay. So let's look at the story of... Oh, we're still on the Nephilim, sorry. <laughs> Not Babel yet. Okay. But we do have the connection already between the Nephilim and Babel with this Nimrod character. It is Nimrod. I know I don't say Nimrod. I wonder if that's why that's a joke in, our, in English. I really do wonder if that's sort of... A... Anyway, part of the problem is is that, you know, <laughs> you know, when you read the Bible sometimes, there'll be plenty that's easy, and then you'll read, and then you'll come across a list of names, and you'll just pass over that, right? Because you're like, you guys, Versha, it's Gergesha, and you're just like, uh. <laughs> and so we don't realize that Nephilim is one word. It, it sort of translates as the fallen ones, is sort of, it's also the word for abortion, and for, and for stillbirth in Hebrew, Nafa. So it, it's something that shouldn't, exist. It's, it's something outside the normal. However, we're going to come across, that's already a weird word, but then we're going to have all these weird terms, Anakim, Emim, Raphaim, and Zamzumim. I like that one. Um, and oftentimes they're right in the midst of other tribal names, and so you just write through them. Um, leap ahead from this time to now um, later in history. In the time of of um, Abraham, when Abraham is first seen wandering into the Holy Land, and God says, "This is the land I'm going to give you," and it mentions um, a few tri- a few of the people um, that are there at that moment. It's in, uh, you don't have to turn there, but I'll just mention it because they. Uh, but again, it's in the midst of all these other groups. So if you weren't a Hebrew, knowing the background and the names, it wouldn't mean anything to you or I. Mm-hmm. Certainly didn't for me for a long time. But it talks about the Rephaim, the Zuzim, the Emim. See, these are all, and the Horites who live in the country. That's who inhabits Canaan when um, uh, uh, Abraham first arrives there. Now, he's just passing through, and that's when he's passing through. God says, I'm going to give you this land. So there's something kind of already interesting in the story we don't get. He goes, of all the places on the earth I could possibly give you, why don't I give you the place where all the Nephilim still live? Right? There's a purpose to what God is doing. We find that out later, which we don't realize at the time. Now, we don't know how they arose again, but we know they're around. And the first indication comes in the book of Numbers. The story is probably a semi-familiar one to most people, except that you never read it closely enough to understand what was being said. They... In Numbers 13, they send the 12 scouts to look at the Holy Land for the very first time, remember? Mm -hmm. So they go. Now, all these verses are on your guys' thing, too, so you don't have to copy down the verses. They're all on the paper I gave you. But um, they go and they look, and we're told when they go to Hebron. So in chapter 13, verse 22, going up by way of the Negev, they reached Hebron, where Ahiman... Sheshai and Talmai, three people, these are named people, descendants of the Anakim were. So the Anakim, one of these lineages of the Nephilim, are um, living in Hebron. So the scouts see them. Then they finally come back and report. And at first they're all excited. They tell them all the good stuff, all the great food, etc. And then all of a sudden in verse 28, they're like, there's a big but, though, Noah, first. <laughs> what is it? Mm-hmm. However, the people who are living in the land are powerful. The lands are, uh, the, the sit- towns are fortified and very large. Besides, we saw the descendants of the Anakim there. Now, again, just reading it, you and I wouldn't necessarily know anything, but when you get to the end, go to the end of this chapter, they spread, okay, so people start to panic. And so Caleb who's the tribe of Judah, and Joshua, who will become the leader after Moses' death, they're the only two. The other ten people are stirring up fear. And the two of them are saying, wait, 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 don't be afraid. This is the same God who wiped out all the gods of Egypt in their own land. Like, he can certainly take care of the Anakim, right? No, and they start freaking out. And now's here where the connection is made. Verse 32, they spread discouraging reports, these are the other ten, among the Israelites saying, The land we went through and reconnoitered is a land that consumes its inhabitants. And all the people we saw there are huge. There we saw the Nephilim. The Anakim are from the Nephilim. So there, in case you had any doubt, 
That's who they are. So they knew them. They knew what they were. Uh -huh. In our eyes, we must have seemed like mere grasshoppers. So it's the Anakim's very presence that is the reason why Israel must wander for 40 years. The same people who saw God defeat the gods of Egypt and Pharaoh don't have enough faith to think he can stand up against these literal descendants of fallen angels. And so God says, fine, 40 years, we'll try again. So... Um, that being said, Moses does strike the first blow against them, but not in the Holy Land itself, but in a land near it. Um, a land that's filled with all kinds of weird symbolism in, in Hebrew understanding. If you go to Deuteronomy now, chapter 2 and 3, there's a name that occurs commonly with the, these people, with the Anakim and the other groups. And that is the word Amorite. Now, what we do know about the Amorites is they're one of the earliest, if not one of the indigenous peoples of the Middle East. The other thing we know about them archaeologically, not as biblical understanding, is they were the first group to ever practice, in as far as we know in the Middle East, child sacrifice. Their connection with the Anakim is only kind of further evidence in the mind of the Hebrews of what these people are and what they bring you know to the human race so in chapters two and three Moses is told to engage two different kings Sion and Og but before that Mo, uh, God sort of lets loose a little bit out of the bag before they get there so remember they're traveling they're wandering their 40 years now it's Deuteronomy so they're about to come back and enter finally and as they're going along, they have to pass three countries, Edom, Moab, and Ammon. So in chapter 2, first they're in Ammon, verse 9. The Lord said to, Moses, to me, to Moses, do not show hostility to the Moabites or engage them to battle. I will not give you possession of any of their land because he's given it to the descendants of Lot. And then look at verse 10. Formerly, the Emim lived there, a people great and numerous, as tall as the Anakim. Like the Anakim, they're considered Rephaim, though the Moabites called them Emim. So don't go there and destroy them. Why? Because they're descended from Abraham like you are. And by the way, they wiped out the Nephilim for me in the land I gave them. He moves on. In Ammon, verse 19, as you come opposite the Ammonites, do not show hostility or come into conflict for the, with them. For I will not give you possession of any of their land. I've given it again to the sent. So again, they're connected. Now verse 20. This also is considered a country of the Rephaim. Formerly the Rephaim dwelt there. The Ammonites called them Zamzuman, a people great and numerous, as tall as the Anakim. But these two the Lord cleared out of the way for the Ammonites, and they dispossessed them. Do you see a pattern? God has chosen Abraham not just to start a new humanity, but to destroy the rival of his own fallen angels. It'll be his people who wipe out all the descendants of the Nephilim. The Emim and the Zamzumim are already extinct by the time Israel comes. But they haven't been touched by Israel, but they have been touched by Semites. So all that's left is this and them. Well, this one's going to end soon because Sion and Og are the last of them. So uh, the, the interesting thing about Sion is um, uh, God has already planted, planned what he's going to do. Verse 26 of chapter 2, this is Moses. I sent messengers from the wilderness to Zion, king of Heshbon, with this offer of peace. So Moses doesn't know everything that's going on, right? He doesn't know everything of God's plan. So he encounters the first king, and he's like, oh. He's not technically in the Holy Land, so I'm going to ask for peace and just move through his land. However, um, verse 30, But Sion, king of Heshbon, refused to let us pass through his land, because the Lord, your God, made him stubborn in mind and obstinate in heart, that he might deliver him into your power. God says, now wait a minute, Moses. <laughs> I'm going to make sure, like Pharaoh, this guy opposes you. Because... What's God saying? I want him dead. Why? Because of what he is. 
He's, the ne he's a Nephilim king. So he's destroyed. By the time they get to Og, Og is kind of an interesting one. Chapter 3. We went to the road to Bashan. But Og doesn't need any, any divine push. Og, the king of Bashan, came out to meet us. Now, Bashan, we don't have time to get into it, but the land of Bashan today is about 30 miles. If you were standing where the temple once stood in Jerusalem today and you look out, it extends, Bashan extends about 30 miles and comes this way. Bashan has multiple um, geographical sites that are of great symbolic significance to, uh, about evil in Israel's history and later the church. The first thing is the name itself, Bashan. That isn't a name that the Hebrews gave it. We know that now for certainty because we found Sumerian or, uh, uh, Babylonian texts that refer to it as Bathan, which is the same word as Bashan in Hebrew in Mesopotamian. What does Bashan mean? The land of the serpent. Okay, That's what the name means. It's in Bashan where the Israelites all get bitten by the poisonous snakes. So this is the land of the snake. And what are the geographical sites in Bashan that are interesting? Well, one is a valley, which you can still walk to on a day trip from Jerusalem to this day, if it's not too hot, called the Valley of the Raphaim. <laughs> and they'll, today when you go, they show you this is where the Philistines camped in the time of David. This is where, but it was, it, it's named after these people. It connects with another, another uh, valley, which is the Valley of ar Hinnom, which in Jesus' time is named Gehenna, the name for hell. Okay, Because in Jesus' time, that valley was kept burning as a garbage site for the entire city of Jerusalem, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. Why? Because it's the valley where Israel became like the Nephilim where the first Israelite kings to ever offer their own children in sacrifice occurred. So by Jesus' time, it was a cursed spot. Um, but it already had this evil reputation going back to the time of King Og. It was called Topheth, which literally means the burning place, because you burn the children there, to Moloch and these other <coughs> deities. Horrible, too. In the, um, I saw one once in, in um, the museum. Balboa Park had one, an, ex an, an exhibit for a while in the Middle East, and it's this horrible pot-bellied, ugly thing, and there's like a receptacle, and these are, it's all carved out of like a stone, and it has its face up here, and hands, and it looks like, it looks like it's a figure sort of sitting there, and there's a bowl. Now, underneath it, you would heat it. This is a rock, okay? It's carved from a piece of rock. And you would place the living child in that to be seared to death. Horrific. Horrific by any means. So, and it's for that reason, those, it's for that reason that God lets Israel be destroyed by Babylon. It was for the sins of those kings that he will never forgive. But anyway, so the place is horrible. It's where Gehenna is, it's where the Rephaim are, it's the land of the serpent, and it's where Mount Hermon is located, which is where the Nephilim, or where, where the fallen angels came to earth. Hebrews believe that. The Babylonians believe that. It's the place where they descended to this world to have sex with human women. So the whole land is horrible. If you had a place that was hell on earth, it's there. And in Jesus' time, it's in that place that Jesus gives Peter the keys to the kingdom. Think about it. You're the rock that holds back all this evil. The gates of the netherworld will never pre prevail against you. Okay. Gates aren't an oppositional thing. It's not people attacking the church. It's the church attacking hell. Did you ever realize that? Gates aren't, aren't offensive. They're defensive. So if the gates of hell won't prevail, what does that mean? That means they collapse under the church's attack. But he does it in that area because of the symbolic significance of what is happening. Caesarea Philippi is right there on the river that, that runs through the valley of the Rephaim, Rephaim. Okay, anyway, so I don't get too far. We can get this finished. So he defeats Og. What's there today in that area? 
Uh, it's well, it's still a, a, a the. Jewish people living in it, or no, no, it's no to this day, no, at least no Orthodox Jews will even allow people to settle the area of yeah. of Gehinnom. Uh, I don't know about the other uh, Raphaim. There's still the remains of Caesarea Philippi are still there. Yeah. You can see them, um, but they're a little they're they're a ways away. So specifically, the land of Bashan itself is yes, uh, Israel settled there. Hebron's part of that, um, but that specific area, that valley, um, that's Gehenna to this day, Gehinnom, our Gehinnom is how they say it in Hebrew, no one settled there um, because it's still considered to be a, a, a cursed land. It's there where the field of Akeldamai is, where Judas hung himself too. Oh. So there's a lot of stuff that connects to that place. But um, let's just end. We know that, let's just run to the end of Og's story. We know he dies. <laughs> But look at verse 11 of chapter 3. Og, king of Bashan, was the last remaining survivor of the Rephaim. He had a bed of iron, nine regular cubits long and four feet wide, which is still preserved in Rabbah at the Ammonites. Now, why would they even tell us about his bed? That's weird. Well, because they're connecting it to the story of, it connects back to the Nephilim story, because the Babylonians practiced what was called, they called it Kwedashat. Kwedashat, the uh, Hebrews had a much more plain term for it, temple prostitutes. And you would go to the Babylonian temples and the Canaanite temples whose religion kind of had filtered through Babylon, and the priestesses or priests would be on duty at different, they would have times that they were on duty. And you would come, and as part of your religious duty to help strengthen the gods and keep the cycles of nature going, you would have sex with these temple prostitutes. This, the weird thing is, and why Israel got so hung up on so many of its laws, was if I go there and I just happen to go because I have two hours to kill and I gotta go make my sacrifice, I go. If it's a female, I have sex with a female. If it happens to be the male on duty, that's why I have to have sex with. Like it was just, I, I, it, it's, it was just such a strange thing to you and I, we can't even like, really maybe get a fathom, but it was, that's why they named the bed. There, and again, it's sexual sin. So you have the Nephilim, you have sexual sin, like the angels that fathered them in the, originally. It's showing this ongoing connection. Now we get to Joshua and there's this horrible thing a lot of people know of in the Bible. And that is what's called harem, the ban, where they would place every man, woman, and child under the penalty of death when they conquered these cities. Now, that was not universal, and in fact, it's very specific. When, if you read the story and you actually look closely, if a city was composed of purely local Canaanite peoples, Deuteronomy 9 tells us you must offer them peace. And if they accept peace and surrender, then yes, they have to be enslaved to you and these different things, but they all live. If they fight against you, then you can do what you need to do. However, if the city is ruled by or allied to, then everyone in it has to be destroyed. They're tainted. And the word harem, destruction, is why this, the mountain that the angels fell to is Hermon. It means destruction. That's what the mountain itself means. You can go to Mount Hermon to this day. If you want to, after hearing all this, you might be a little too <laughs> terrified. But Joshua actually tells us that. But again, we never, I never knew this until a lot later. But for example, go to chapter 11 of Joshua, where he's, he's listing what he's done. So this is his survey of some of the attacks afterwards. 11? Mm -hmm. Look at verse 21. Joshua chapter 11, verse 21. At that time, Joshua penetrated the mountain regions and exterminated the Anakim in Hebron, Debir, Anab, and the entire mountain region of Judah and the entire mountain region of Israel. Joshua put them and their cities under the ban so that no Anakim were left in the land of the Israelites. It wasn't indiscriminate kill whoever. It was kill them. They need, there is no surrender for them. Now we're told something at the end though. However, some survived because they weren't in Israel. They're along the coast of what would become the Philistines later 
Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod. Now think ahead. Where was Goliath from? Goliath of Gath. Six foot six. Which was huge back then, but not comically so, right? Um, now, the oldest, the oldest copies of the Bible we have, which are the versions found in the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the, of the Old Testament. Those are the oldest full copies of the Bible we have. Both of them put um, Goliath's height at six foot six. Our modern, what's called the Masoretic text, which was created by the Hebrews in about the year 200 AD, so much later, and which modern Catholic Bibles, not the Vulgate, but modern ones, at least in the United States, use as our Old Testament, um, they kind of jumped it. I guess he wasn't scary enough. In his, they're not, he's like nine foot nine, which becomes, then it becomes sort of comical. Right? Well, no, he's, the oldest copies say he was about six foot six. Now, what happens then is, very briefly, all of a sudden, Israel is ruled by all these judges and things like this. They renege on the deal. They don't continue to fight the Canaanites. They don't settle the whole place. So in other words, it gets too hard for them, right? They don't want to fight anymore. So they're like, oh, we're done. And so we're told at the beginning of the book of Judges after Joshua where all these pockets of pagans still rule. They could live there, but they had to be under Israelite control. But the Israelites don't do it. And it mentions every single tribe that this happens to. And so the angel of the Lord comes to the people and he tells them, I'm leaving, right? You've given up, you're not fighting, so know now that these people are gonna be this thorn in your side. And so you go through all the time of the judges, and if you read the book, it's just a horrible time in Israel's history. And then you finally get to the point of Samuel, and then all of a sudden, there's this request for a king. And why is the request for a king such a big deal? Why is it so odious? Why does Samuel hate it? And even God is frustrated. Because they specifically say two things. They say, give us a king who rules over us like all the other nations. And two, he will fight our battles for us. So, the, you know, in, in the Exodus, God is a warrior. Lord is his name. We sing all these things at like Easter time and stuff. So the divine warrior himself isn't good enough anymore. You want to be like the pagans now. The one who defeated the Nephilim, the one who defeated all the gods of Egypt, but now you want your own guy. And who do they pick as king? Saul. What is Saul's outstanding characteristic? Can you remember? Height. He's the tallest Israelite. Now, isn't that ironic? He's not a Nephilim, but the irony is you can choke on. That's why it takes... David to cement the kingship. Why? Because single-handedly he kills as a young boy a great Nephilim warrior before whom Saul won't even face. And so you, you have to understand the story. And then from there, David's people will destroy the last of the Nephilim. There are none today as far as we know. So we can end, <laughs> so we can end the Nephilim with chapter 21, verse 15 of 2 Samuel. And notice, these are the Philistines, because that's where they fled to, those cities, and so became part of those nations. Oh, by the way, remember in the very beginning when they went in the book of Numbers, I mentioned there were three actual individual Nephilim named? Well, we're told later in Joshua 15 and Joshua, in Judges chapter 1 that Caleb never let it go. <laughs> he first chased them, they fled, then he chased them down finally and killed them after 45 years. He found all those people, like they were not going to escape him. So in a sense, as the, as the Judahite, he kind of portrays David. But here's, um, here's the story, 21, 15 through uh, 22. There was another battle between the Philistines and Israel. Now, this is near the end of David's reign. He's an old man now, so he probably shouldn't be fighting. That's the point. There was another battle between the Philistines and Israel. David went down with his servants and fought the Philistines, but David grew tired. Dadu, a descendant of the Rephaim, whose bronze spear weighed 300 shekels, was about to take him captive. Dadu was girt with a new sword and thought he would kill David. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, came to help him and struck and killed the Philistine. 
Verse 18, after this, there was another battle with the Philistines in Gob. On that occasion, Sibekai the Hushathite struck down Saph, a descendant of the Rephaim. There was another battle, and Elhanan, son of Jer, killed Goliath of Gath, who spear shot another. In other words, verse 22, look how it ends. These four were descended from the Rephaim and Gath, and they fell at the hands of David and his servants. So David finishes what Joshua started. David now, God's people have rid the world of the Nephilim. Now, the one problem is, is that while the Nephilim themselves don't exist, their legacy goes on, so to speak, in the people of Babylon. Now, going back to the Nephilim, we knew that Nimrod had founded the land of Babylon in Shinar. And so now we go to the third fall, which is Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel. And we're told that the whole world had the same language, the same words. When they were migrating from the east, they came to a valley in the land of Shinar, and settled there. They said to one another, come, let us mold bricks and harden them with fire. They used bricks for stone and bitumen for mortar. They said, come, let us build a tower, ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the sky and so make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we shall be scattered over all the earth. Now you need to recognize what's happening here. We are seeing a repeat of Eden. Two things are involved here. A direct, a direct disobedience to God's direct command. And pride that I will take divinity for myself. Why do they want the tower to reach the skies? So they can literally take Eden back by force. Right? What you denied to us, we will now take. So you have the same thing as grabbing for the apple. I'm going to be like God now, what's the other? What's the direct disobedience? Well, in the first story, it was, don't eat of this apple, or the tree. It's not really an apple. Um, the reason we say that is the word for apple in Latin is malum, which means evil. So, but it's not necessarily an apple. Anyway, and Eve just goes, pluck, right? Now, I told you that just before, the last story before this was Noah. And Noah, the covenant was renewed. And what did God say? Be fruitful, multiply, and Fill the earth, right? The point is you're supposed to extend over this world and make this world into Eden. And what do they say? We're not going to be scattered. Direct violation. Yeah. Screw you, God. <laughs> We're doing exactly the opposite. We're all settling right here, doing our thing. So the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people had built. The Lord said, if now while they are one people have the same language, they've started to do this. Nothing they presume to do will be out of their reach. Now, God isn't scared of us. What he is saying is this. If I let this lie as it is, can you imagine how corrupt humanity will become? They'll all be united in evil. And so he scatters their language and they go. Now, on the surface, you say, okay, so what's the big deal? In the sense of where are the angels we've been talking about? Well, they come in at this point. And this is why I said you always have to be careful and understand there's a lot of stuff that the story is giving us that's not all at one place. Turn to Deuteronomy 32 when Moses is addressing the people of Israel. Right before he dies, he wants to give his last will and testament and tell them they're about to enter the Holy Land. In other words, they're about to start this process by which Joshua is going to conquer a land that right now belongs to literally the descendants of other gods. And so he's telling them to remember their history. Deuteronomy 32. So in this large thing, and later he'll talk about demon worship and everything else, but in verses 7 through 9, God says something, or Moses tells them something. First verse 7, he says, Remember the days of old, consider the years of generations past, Ask your father, he will inform you, your elders, and they will tell you. Now, I want to stop here for a moment. Clearly, Moses assumes that the people here all know what he's talking about. In other words, I'm just reminding you of something you've known from the beginning. From when? Since Abraham. Now, what does he know? And what is it that Abraham knew? 
And notice Abraham's story starts immediately after the Tower of Babel. And here's why. When the Most High, verse 8, that's God, when the Most High allotted each nation its heritage, because he split them, right? Before that, there were no nations ever mentioned. When he separated out human beings, he set up the boundaries of the people after the number of the divine beings, or sons of God. But the Lord's portion was his people. His allotted share was Jacob. So here's what, in effect, happened. God creates humanity in the garden. We muck everything up. Right? He even gives us the chance to repent right at the beginning. What did you do? And Adam goes, not me. <laughs> right? To the woman. And sort of you too, because you gave me this woman. Right? And then Eve's like, not me. It was only the serpent. He totally forced me to. And so they don't take the opportunity, so paradise ends. And then instead of growing better, the hum human race keeps getting more and more corrupt till by the time of Noah, you've got Nephilim ruling things, and even the whole line of Seth has become corrupted, so there's only one human family left. And so God is not gonna leave humanity to end, all descended from the first murderer, Cain's people, through the intermarriage and stuff, full of idolatry, these Nephilim, so he wipes out the world and starts over. Well, what happened? They, immediately afterwards, you have male rape, you've got you know, incest going on, you've got all these other horrible things, and so humanity keeps playing it over again. So now he finally gives them another chance, <laughs> and here they are at Babel, and they're literally reliving Eden before his eyes. And so here's what God does. And it's, I, I don't want to go through all the passages. We've taken way too much time on this as it is. But here's what God does. God disinherits the human race. You don't want to worship me? Fine. Each of you will be under the guardianship of a specific angel, a powerful angel. That's why they're called the sons of God, who I place over you. Now, as it was meant to work, those angels were meant to bring human beings to knowledge of the true God. Out of them, out of the nations, God will now pick one man from which he will create a whole new group. And to this day, long before, long before we had the spit in the tube and send it and get your results back for genealogies, um, I had a lady in my class a couple of years ago, we talked about this because she was a geneticist in her younger years. She's um, retired now for a long time. But we talked about the fact there is no Jewish ethnicity. In other words, if you look at Jewish DNA under a microscope and look at, they do a spit test, there's not going to come up anything that's Jewish. And that was God's point, is he makes his, a people that are connected only to him. But they're from this disinherited human race. And then through them, they will eventually redo and save the human race. That's why the three promises, I'm gonna give you my land, a land, just like Eden was my land, and I'm gonna dwell there with you in the tabernacle, so I'll be present to you. So you have a new Eden, you're the new Adam, Israel. I'm gonna give you kingship, because you were meant to rule and have dominion over this world, but humanity squandered it to the fallen angels. So you're gonna be a king. And then the last one, and through you, all the nations of the earth will find blessing. So he's disinherited them for the time being until in and through Israel, which ultimately is the Messiah in Christ, he brings them back. Hence we come to the end of Matthew's gospel, go forth into the world and make disciples of all nations. Right? Filling them with my life, baptizing them, teaching them the truth, and I will be with you personally till the end of this age. Right? That's the storyline. So these beings, they're basically, you can think of them as ultra-powerful guardian angels who not only rule over individuals or, or assist individuals, they rule over groups. And we have some um, stories of them in the Old Testament and the New. We'll just look very briefly because I don't want to take too long. But let's look at Daniel, the book of Daniel. And... Let me find it. Daniel, I think it's Daniel 10. Yeah, go to Daniel chapter 10. Chapter 10? Yes. At the time of, of Daniel chapter 10, 
Israel is now in exile. They're actually living in Babylon, right? God could not have made it more plain to Israel. You guys screwed up so bad, you're literally starting over at square one where I pulled Abraham from. You don't have a land, you don't have a king, you have nothing, and you're back literally where you literally started from Babylon. But at the same time, God wants to comfort them. And so Daniel is this prophet, and he has these images of the different beasts and what's going to happen to Israel until the birth of the Messiah. And then finally in chapter 10, you have his encounter. Now, he had encountered this being before, and the being is Gabriel. The, today's the Feast of the Archangels. But he, he only describes him this time in verse 5. He says, I looked up, I saw a man dressed in linen with a belt of fine gold around his waist. His body was like, is that chrysolite? I know it's, a, it's like a gold brown color, isn't it? Kind of like, anyone know? Precious gems. Anyway, you get the feeling from his image. His face shone like lightning. His eyes were fiery torches. His arms and feet looked like burnished bronze. And the sound of his voice was like the roar of a multitude. Right? He's on fire. In the other language, it says he's, he's like the seraphim. He burns with the love of God. All the imagery of him is fire and burning. And, bar and when Daniel sees him, he passes out. <laughs> he's like, right? Now you know why the angels always say, don't be afraid when they first show up. <laughs> then a hand touched me, verse 10, raising me to my hands and knees. Daniel, beloved, he said, understand the words which I'm speaking to you. Stand up for my mission is now to you. He says, because from the first day you made your mind to acquire, made up your mind to acquire understanding and humble yourself before God, your prayer was heard. Because of it, I started out. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia stood in my way for 21 days until finally Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. I left him there with the prince of the king of Persia and came to make you understand what shall happen to your people in the last days, for there is yet a vision concerning the days. And then he describes some of the stuff and in the, near the very end of the chapter, in verse uh, 20, he says, Do you know, he asked, why I, have to, why I have come to you? Soon I must fight the prince of Persia again. When I leave, the prince of Greece will come. But I shall tell you, what is written in the book of truth. No one supports me against these except Michael, your prince. So now we know that's what he's talking about. The prince of the king of Persia is the angel who oversees that people, ethnicity, lineage. We don't know exactly how God determined it. And he's powerful enough because fallen angels have not lost their power. That won't be until they're judged. He's powerful enough to hold Gabriel back for three weeks. Did you see that? 21 days until Michael came and relieved him. And the only one of the princes who has remained true, Gabriel tells us, is Michael. All the other ones have betrayed the Lord. Those are the, peop those are the groups that Paul is always talking about, and Peter will mention them in his letter later stuff. When they talk about the principalities, the powers, what's a principality? It's the land that a prince rules. And we know now from Daniel that they're referred to as princes. And so a principality is these are the, these are the angels that control whole swaths of this world. And they're angelic. They are not human. They work through humans, but they're not human. They're powerful. When Paul describes them, and he describes them a lot, let's just look at one verse, and then we'll look at one more thing, and then we'll end this part. In Ephesians chapter 6, a famous passage where Paul talks about spiritual warfare. Now again, the interesting thing is Satan is in no way connected with this story originally. So we don't know if he had any part in it, or if over time he seduced those princes to his side, or they became corrupted on their own, and then he simply assumed authority over them. We do know by the time of the New Testament, he rules over all of them as a king. Remember, that's why he tells Jesus, all the kingdoms in the world have been given to me, and I can give them to whoever I want. I'll give them to you if you just bow down and worship me. So Jesus doesn't say, no, you don't, right? Yeah, he does. He 
He rules them all, but he rules them through these other beings that he stands above. And that's why Paul connects him, but he also makes it singular versus plural here. Look what he says. He says, um, verse 12, or actually, no, verse 11. Put on the armor of God so that you may be able to stand firm against the tactics of the devil. So you have the individual singular guy you need to be aware of. But then very next statement. Our struggle is not with fresh flesh and blood, but with the principalities, with the powers, with the world rulers of this present darkness, the evil spirits in the heavens. Now, these are not little demons, because look what Paul says. Therefore, put on the armor of God that you may be able to resist on the evil day and having done everything to hold your ground. Now, think about that. The demons, even a normal Christian, has great authority over. These things are too powerful. The best you can do with God, and that's why you need him, is hold your ground. You're not going to gain on these beings. There's no way in the present state of our existence. All you can do is hold strong. But don't worry, they will be punished someday. And that's the last thing we'll look at. Psalm 82. Here you have their judgment, which is actually talked about a lot in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. The book of Revelation talks about this. But here you have it very clear. <laughs> Psalm 82. God takes a stand in the divine council, gives judgment in the midst of the gods, the Elohim. So he's in his council, and now the whole council is in session of all the angelic beings from highest to lowest, and now he's going to call out these specific ones that he gave a specific role to to guide humanity. And they failed. So this is God speaking. How long will you judge unjustly and favor the cause of the wicked? Defend the lowly and the fatherless. Render justice to the afflicted and the needy. Rescue the lowly and poor. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. Then the psalmist comments. He says, the gods neither know nor understand wandering about in darkness. Remember, we looked at, Paul said, they don't know the plan of God. They don't know the gospel. They don't know when Jesus will come. They didn't know they shouldn't have crucified him. They're in darkness. They're in ignorance. However, because they're meant to be these, these pillars that help hold the world up, we're told all the world's foundations shake, right? Why does the world suck? Because of us and also because of the ones who have let things go really out of control, who were supposed to do something about it. And so in verse 6, he pronounces judgment, verse 6 and 7. I declare, gods though you may be, offspring of the Most High, all of you, yet like any mortal, you shall die. Like any prince, and there you have the prince connection again, you shall fall. How does an angel die? Yeah. Jesus tells us in Matthew, when he condemns, when he, when, when he, when Jesus um, congratulates the sheep, what does he say? Enter into the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. When he damns the goats, he does not say you were always destined to be here. He said, no, he says, go into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell is the experience of death for a spiritual being. They'll get to know what death feels like forever. Human beings are only put there because God doesn't have anywhere else to put us who have joined in their rebellion. It wasn't meant for human beings, but it's where we go if there's no other choice left to the Lord at the end. So now you see when Paul talks about the battle as being that of against the world, the flesh, and the devil. In the one sense, you can say, yeah, it's the, the human culture, it's my own selfishness, and then it's the devil. And that's all true, that's correct. But in another sense, it's all from the demons, right? <laughs> because this one, these are, these are ruled by the gods or princes. Over us is the world. The devil is the serpent who continually does whatever he wants as the 
original rebel and, and opponent of God. And then even the flesh goes back to the story of Hermon and the Nephilim and all the sexual problems and sins they introduced into the human race. So in a sense, everything returns to them. We've always been willing participants, don't get me wrong, that's why we're judged. But the supernatural worldview behind our whole religion and faith is, is huge, much more than we realize or give it credit for. When I, when I quoted Peter, those t or John, in his letter those two times we looked at it, you know, he pointed out, what was Jesus' mission? It was to destroy the works of the devil. It was to do all these things. The only way he can free us is by destroying those works of the devil. We have to enter into this battle. The devil's mad, we're told, because he knows he has a short time. But he's fighting badly. Now why? Because... In his mind, he might just win. And here's why. Not because he necessarily thinks he can overthrow God, but he was able to destroy Israel and, in, and end it entirely in its mission to make the world Eden. So that God himself had to come and start a whole new community of Jew and Gentile to do it over again. But I guarantee, and I don't think I'm wrong in this, you might disagree, I guarantee when when Satan looks at the human race right now today, he thinks, I got a long time. I got a long time. These people are never going to get it together. Because until we do, until we make that extension of the gospel throughout, he's not going to be judged. He's got, in his mind, I've got all the time in the world. Until humanity gets it together, follows the faith, does these things. In fact, he probably thinks he is winning right now because it looks pretty bad for the church and the human race right now. So his battle, the, the, his end is clear. The timetable is not. The timetable is not. And he won before in his mind. I mean, God had a plan that even through that, it was, but from his point of view, it's worth it. And I don't think it's hard to, uh, Father Amorth talks about this in one of his other books, Gabriel Amorth, that was the name too of the exorcist. He talks about the fact that we cannot even begin to fathom even the worst human being that we can think of, a Hitler or someone. We cannot even begin to fathom the hatred that is found in this being, okay? He would see all creation torn down just to make God lose in some way. And if he can wipe out every human being, and even in his death throes as he's going down, if he can take as many of us as possible, he will gladly do so. Um, and, and Father Amor talks about when you look at some of these things like the abortion movement and you see how violent and crazy people, if you ever looked when they filmed the crowds of people, he says, it, there's something, there's something beyond even human evil that drives those things, that you get a little bit of a glimpse of, of what these things are really like behind the scenes, how they drive, how they push people. Now, they can't force any of us to do anything. But they find a lot of willing people through, you know, nursing hatreds, grudges, angers, feeling disappointed, all the things that people do, and turn that to their advantage. Um, and that's why, you know, the church has a huge thing. We haven't talked about spiritual warfare, actually, in this. But um, this is the whole setup that's behind Peter's whole view right now, and why he puts his trust in the Holy Spirit and not in angels, even the good ones, that know... With the Holy Spirit, we can't fail because only God can overcome these things. But he only will do it through us. He won't do it himself. He does it through us. He still made Joshua attack those people, even though he gave him the power to defeat them. He still made, you know, he still makes us go forward. So I think it also shows us how important evangelization is. Because in the, in the Catholic Church, we've become really pathetic at it. It's true. Um, we're bleeding people so quickly, we're also the slowest growing convert group in the world of every religion, including every other Christian religion, yeah. in the world at this moment. Um, and we're losing the most of any religion in this world at the moment. So Catholicism needs to kind of regain that understanding. This might help a little because 
while it's true that God judges people on what they know, and to some extent we have to realize that there isn't really a neutral stance towards God. The world and everything it throws at you is opposed to him 100%. And if you really realize the reality of a struggle that's going on behind us, it would be hard-pressed to call you a real Christian if you weren't concerned about those who aren't following at least the Christian faith, if not the Catholic one specifically. Because these things are, are although we don't see them, they're, they have a power and the thing that they'll do that we can't begin to imagine. And God will let it stay because you've made your choice. Jesus says, if you're not for me, you're against me. There's no third option in heaven. You don't get to go up to the gates and go, well, I just chose to do nothing. I didn't hurt anybody, but I didn't do anything important either. I didn't help because our role is what? To extend God's kingdom on the world. That was from Adam on. That's not just Christianity. That's the human dimension. If you don't do that at the end and you get before him, what's your, what are you going to tell him? Well, you know how it is. Got a job and kids and I just... You know, I didn't want to upset people, you know. So I think maybe that puts a little more emphasis. And also the fact that there's a lot more to how much freedom God gives us in the final determination of when it occurs. Remember, we talked about that a few weeks ago. God determines the end, but he gives his creations the means that they pick themselves. And so if we pick ourselves to go as slow as possible, then... We're just prolonging the suffering of the whole human race, not doing what we're supposed to do, you know. And so there's a lot of, of push for this. Real quick, we're at our end, but because it's the holy angels, um, the angels each, the three archangels that we know, Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael, all have a huge part to play in our spiritual growth. Not just spiritual warfare, but spiritual growth. The tradition of the church has always understood the basic understanding of our spiritual journey is three ways. It's called the three ways. We have to purge ourselves of sin by cooperating with God's grace. We become illuminated by his, his spirit and the gifts of the spirit and such, enlightened, and we grow in love. And so each of these angels helps us with a particular part. Michael's the warrior. Michael's the one who helps us in the process of our purgation, along with our own guardian angel, to help us purge ourselves and bring us to the state of peace. Peace with God, peace with ourselves, and therefore we can pursue peace with others. Gabriel's the one of illumination, right? He's always coming with messages to the Virgin Mary, to Daniel. He's always revealing and enlightening. He's helping us understand the plan, understand how to be more Christ-like. And so he leads us to truth. And then Raphael, because he's the one who's concerned with marriage and all the connections there in the book of Tobit, he's the one who is perfection or union because he's the one who's helping us learn to exist in charity. Because the, our resurrected life in some way will mirror that of the angels. In that prayer I had, which is, I didn't write that, it is a real prayer of the church, you'll notice he said, we want to inherit your angelic purity. What did Jesus say? The resurrected people are like the angels in heaven. So our spiritual life of the resurrection in the kingdom will be like the angels, the holy angels of how they exist now. Ours will be a bodily one, so it'll be, we're not angels, but it'll be similar. Therefore, the angels are a huge model for the understanding of how we ourselves grow in spirituality. And throughout the whole Middle Ages, it was huge. I have whole books of just angelic spirituality by different authors, from Aquinas to um, Bernard of Clairvaux to Bonaventure. So the angels, make a, make an, a specific thing today to really pray to your guardian angel, whose feast day is a f only a few days now, on October 2nd. To, um, and to maybe focus on the power of asking these angels to help you as well. They belong to the Virgin as her guardians. They flow from the Holy Spirit. And so there are these really great, powerful spiritual warriors that help us in our faith. Okay, so next week we're finally back to just normal stuff. It'll seem so boring when we come back from like, all the angels. Yeah. But let's, <laughs> let's just end in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord, and we ask, especially on this day, the specific intercession 
protection and guidance of the three archangels of whom you have given us names, Lord. We ask for Michael the Prince to continue to defend the people of God, Israel, and his church, and to continue to just help us fight sin and imperfection and vice and temptation, and to grow in that trust of God that he can help deliver us into so that we can achieve, achieve, achieve that peace for which you promise, Lord. We also ask for the intercession of uh, the Archangel Gabriel, who is the one honored to be able to approach the Blessed Mother and tell her of her great part to play in the mystery of salvation, the one who had already told Daniel everything that would occur to Israel until the birth of the Messiah. And it is he who continually, through the prophecies in, he inspired and through the prophets he continues to inspire, who helps us understand our victory, who we are in Christ, and to lead us into that gift of truth, to make it the foundation of our own lives. And finally, we lift up, of course, Raphael, who we know the most of from his story here on earth, how he guards marriage, how he guards travelers, how he helps with financial problems, how he attacks and overcomes the demons like Asmodeus, and most of all, how he teaches us to love and to trust in the entire journey of life, for he is the healer of God, both soul and body, and we ask for his healing, Lord, to become more of the people we were meant to be. We ask you to inspire us with devotion to them and to help us be encouraged to emulate their act activities and their mission in our life and so truly become the people of God we were called to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. Good session. <laughs> <laughs> really good. <laughs>